Do you want to grow apples but fear that it won't succeed just because your apples come with the label that says that it requires three, four, five hundred, a thousand chill hours? Well, guess what? Apparently, many of these varieties don't even require that much of a chill hour as historically believed. And the person that's going to discredit a lot of these old resources is my friend and plant expert Tom Spellman of the Dave Wilson Nursery, which is the largest distributor of deciduous fruit and nut trees in the country. And we're going to learn from him in the experimental orchard his apple orchard in the city of Irvine, California, which has a chill hour that is below 200 chill hours per year. In addition, while we're there, the master gardeners are going to be there thinning the apple trees. And I'm gonna share with you a few helpful tips on thinning fruits that we learned from Tom. Okay, that we're gonna remove. And then we'll remove the inferior fruit set. And here we go. And now we've alleviated a lot of that stress on this particular branch. Well, I hope you now enjoy this educational opportunity brought to you by Tom Spellman of the Dave Wilson Nursery. Enjoy. Hi, my name is Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics, where we grow cool plants. And today we're here in Irvine, California at the High Chill Apple Orchard with Tom Spellman, who I'm honored and humbled to be near who represents the Dave Wilson Nursery which is America's leading distributor of bare root fruit trees and nut trees and so much more. Thanks so much for being out here this morning with me. Well thank you Charles. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and, and tour you through this project which I'm really proud of. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I know a few weeks ago when we started exchanging emails you said you know that I'd meet you out at the high chill, and I wrote in my notes high and low, as you can see here. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, why would I want a high chill apple when be, being here in Irvine, which is Southern California? Why would I want anything that's high when my focus should be on low chill? Because we don't even have cold winters here. Absolutely, and and you know the the idea and the concept uh, for this project started with me probably. 30 plus years ago when um, I was uh, working for Laverne Nursery doing some uh, citrus and avocados and we started doing a lot of deciduous fruit trees as well and I started getting comments from people and, and, and they would say, yeah, I've got a, uh, a red delicious apple in Malibu and I've got a Arkansas black apple in Costa Mesa and, and a Hudson's Golden Gem in, in downtown Orange. And, my first response to these people was always it's you know what you probably got a mistag tree yeah because everybody knows that apples are too high chill to grow in orange county so yep. you, you know you're not going to get fruit down here but then i started to go and meet some of these people and look at some of these trees in their landscape and sure enough here's an arkansas black apple in costa mesa that probably gets 100 to 200 chill hours a year and it's a it's a seven or eight hundred hour variety how yep. can that be so as more time went on and I started looking at more trees and, and dealing with more people, I realized that I don't think this high chill apple thing is, is, is what they say it is. I think that, that apples have an adaptability that puts them in a different category than most other deciduous fruit trees. I, I proposed this project to several years ago, a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. John Kabashima, and, um, and he, he told me the same thing. He goes, well, if you do an experiment like that and and it and it fails, you know how are you going to feel? And I said, John, it's just that it's an experiment. If I fail, I <laughs> it's fail. An, it's knowledge. Hey, hey yeah. here's the deal. If I fail, you're never going to hear anything about it. Yeah. So I don't need to say anything. But but we, what we did was we chose uh, about 30 different varieties of apples that are rated in in chill requirement from between 500 and 1100 chill hours. Okay planted them on this site here in Irvine, California, where we get an average chill of about 100 to 150 hours in a good year, maybe 200 hours. So theoretically, none of these varieties should have produced any fruit here. Talking about chill hours, firstly, we're in Irvine, California. Our grow zone is what? Oh, depending on the, the zone map you use, I think we're like a, a you know, a, a, 
a 10A or a 10B probably along yeah. those lines. Which means, I kind of wrote this for my notes, so a 10A would be something with nighttime lows somewhere between 30 and 35 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, I would say, too cold you know, for, and we're talking about nighttime low temperatures in the coldest part of winter. Yeah. Um, 10B being between 35 and 40 degrees, which right. I would say is probably more closer to, and more accurate with what we're dealing with as more of a 10B yeah. type of night. I agree. And when we're talking about chill hours, most varieties need, I think in my research, it says between 500 to 1,000 chill hours. What are chill hours? Well, yeah, let's let's define that. Yeah. So um, there are several different models of, of chill throughout the United States, but the model that we use here in, in Southern California uh, would define a chill hour as uh, wintertime night temperatures between freezing at 32 okay. and 45 degrees Fahrenheit accumulated from a period starting about November 1 until January 31. So you've got uh, a 90 day period to accumulate as many chill hours as you, as you can. Now, uh, some of the models actually have uh, a contradictory theme along with them that would subtract any hours that are in the mid to high 60s or above 70 degrees during that same period of time. Okay. So if we go back to the winter of 2018, when we had 90 degree temperatures through a lot of December, January, and February, the accumulation of chill here in Irvine was negative. We were probably in the, in the area of negative 50 to 75 hours. Wow. But if we, if we look at this year, when we actually had what I would consider almost a perfect Southern California winter, yeah. we, we accumulated chill right into February. It stayed cool. We didn't have days in the 60s or, se or high 60s or, or low 70s. Correct. Uh, we probably accumulated between three and 400 chill hours down here this year, which is phenomenal. That that's, is a lot. That's way above average, yeah. but it's still below that 500 to 1100 mark that it would require for most of these apples to produce fruit. Yeah. So this project's been in the ground now for six years, uh, 31 varieties in the ground right now. Okay. We have uh, fruit on 30 varieties this year. So 31 varieties, all of them requiring, according to the research backing up that tree, right. more than 500 yes. chill hours. Growing them here in Irvine, of the 31 fruit trees, you're saying 30 of them are fruiting well. Yeah, and pretty well when you look at the trees behind us. Yeah, you know, we're going to take a and, tour. And, 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 and these and have all these been off. thinned. You know, <laughs> yeah. These have all been thinned considerably. Well, so. I have a video with Consuelo, which is one of the master gardeners of your team, which I heard during your interview with them that you said they'll be rewarded with getting to enjoy the yields of apples behind <laughs> us um, as a reward for the time, energy, and effort that they put into the main maintenance that goes into caring for these apples here in this apple orchard. Absolutely. I, I, I have a huge <laughs> respect and value in the Master Gardener Volunteer Group from, from Orange County here that I'm, I'm able to work with on this project. Otherwise, it's, it's, uh, it's me and, and uh, James McCollum <laughs> and, and uh, Greg Rager that when we need to get a job done, we have a pool of people that we can draw from and they're, they're very smart. They're all local people. They all love outdoors. They all love gardening. And I, so this morning we had nine people down here thinning fruit, which gets, gets the work done for me that would take me literally weeks to do. So with the high chill varieties that you've got behind us, mm -hmm. and the one I've got experience with, I planted a Granny Smith apple tree in Mission Viejo, which is part of Orange County here, mm -hmm. and a low, you know, in a, in a low chill zone. But I know Granny Smith research, the tag came with saying requires, I believe somewhere close to 800 to 1,000 chill hours. And I'm like, I ignored it. I'm like, let me just plant it because I like Granny Smith apples. And sure enough, we've been enjoying hundreds of apples consistently year after year for 10 years. Right. So I'm one of those people that you know defies the research that's standing behind this Granny Smith apple. I've seen it even as low. The lowest I've seen is 400 hours, which means it still wouldn't be suitable for a Southern California grow climate yet. It's for sale pretty much everywhere I go. Right. Um, what are the varieties that you've got here behind us that you're defying this high chill um, notion behind these apple varieties? Well, you know, we, we have a, an accumulation of varieties here. Um, some of my favorites in the project uh, are uh, Dixie Red Delight. Okay. Uh, it's done very well. Hudson's Golden Gem has done very well. Waltana, uh, the old Bramley's, which is an English pie apple. 
Uh, even some varieties like um, Brayburn yep. has done extremely well. Golden Delicious has done extremely well. Arkansas Black has done extremely well. So we're taking all these varieties that, that shouldn't be grown here and proving that, that you can. And, and the main focus of this project for me was just to redefine the definition of chill hours on apples. I, I think that it's kind of a misconception that, the, that apples require a lot of, of chill. When I was doing a little bit of research before I started this project, I stumbled on some hundred year old information on an organization called the Costa Mesa Apple Growers Association. And okay. I thought, well, that's interesting. What, what, what's this? Yeah. Come to find out that they were growing hundreds of acres of, of, of commercial apples in the teens and 20s on the Newport bench and in, in Costa Mesa, California, oh, wow. right in the middle of, of, of coastal Orange County. And they were getting commercial yields on varieties that are, were, they didn't even know what chill hours really meant at that time. They just planted so, them yeah, and they... Nobody told them you can't grow apples in Costa Mesa or yep. on the Newport bench, so they did it and they were successful. That's fantastic. So, you know, that was one of the, the things that where I thought, you know what, if, if they could do this, uh, we, we can replicate this and, and make it work. And it's been successful beyond my wildest expectations. That's, that's excellent. And that's great to hear. And of the 30, as we kind of said, and I just want to make sure that the um, viewer understands this, of the 30 varieties that have fruited well here from the 31 that you planted, mm -hmm. that one, if you can explain, what is that one variety that we should be avoiding or maybe not avoiding? Well, interestingly enough, um, most of this project was planted six years ago. But about two years ago, I, I added three new varieties to the project. And um, in, in the heat spike that we had last summer, we actually lost uh, two of those, but the third one survived. So the one variety that is uh, not producing is the small little weak tree over in the far row okay. that's still only one year in the ground. So it just hasn't developed yet. Hasn't, hasn't, developed, hasn't developed spur wood yet. So we can't judge it yet. No, no, I wouldn't <laughs> judge it yet. That's good. But so, I definitely have to say that 30 out of the 31 are productive. So. But this is an awesome experiment. And you're, this is your concept, your, your idea that you brought to this section of the garden here in Irvine. Yeah, uh, you know, it was my idea along with encouragement from uh, some of the other local master gardeners, some of the other local retail nurserymen, uh, California rare fruit growers, yeah. that were the original ones that told me, no, no, it, it does grow here, you know? Well, that's just and, like so awesome because you have no idea how many people I've met along the way that are like, you can't grow apples. And I've got like three varieties growing on my backyard and they're all fruiting with branches that are ba you know, breaking. We'll talk about thinning, I see you're thinning. That'll be the first thing I do when I get back home um, and the value that comes behind it. Hopefully we can touch upon that. So you've helped clarify and define the fact that you can grow apples in a warmer climate such as Southern California. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we'll, uh, we'll be publishing some sort of a report on it this coming late fall or, or early winter um, just so that, you know, we can. And, and the reason that I did this is I'm not trying to break any rules. I'm not trying to really... Um, you know, change anybody's philosophy. I just want people to feel comfortable that they can do some of these things in their backyard. There are so many different apple varieties that are adaptable to Southern California. Yeah. You've got super low chill varieties like Anna and Dorset Golden. Okay. But I would, I would say those are anomalies. Those, those are fruit that are ripe in June and July. They bloom, you know, every year. They don't even want to go dormant and drop their foliage in Southern California. Yeah. We know those have worked. They've worked here for decades. Okay. But some of the other varieties that were rated as higher chill varieties, everybody just ignored. So they're eating apples in, 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 in June and July and maybe early August on some of the varieties like Gala or, or you know, old fashioned Fuji. But when it started coming to some of the other varieties, I like, you know, I like apples in the fall. I like apples in the winter. These fruit are gonna hang on the tree until the trees go dormant in January. Yeah. The best apples you're gonna get in Southern California, the ones you're picking off the tree in January. Yeah. They're absolutely spectacular. So it's pretty cool. You just said that, I mean, you can have fruit June, July, depending on the varieties. Mm -hmm. Which one are the early fruiting again? Uh, Anna and Dorset Golden are very early. So you've got those varieties and then there's, you know, what would be like a mid year? Well, uh, Galas and uh, Ghost Apple and Fuji Apples start to ripen in, in uh, August and into September. And then, you know, we come into some of the 
the later varieties, you know, Pink Lady seems to be real okay. adaptable. Sundowner seems to be real adaptable. But those were varieties that were rated as as lower chill. And I know so, my like um, Granny Smith is typically later in the year. I would late, say October, season, November, right. sometime even December. Over well, harvesting. you know, interesting thing with Granny Smith is, uh, you know, I didn't put it in this project, but it's in another project just directly north of us. Okay. And the and the reason that I didn't include Granny Smith was because we already had it here uh, on the property. But, um, you know, Granny Smith is one of those varieties that when you buy it commercially in the market, it's bright green and it's as, as hard as a hardball. Oh, good and, point. And, and Granny Smith <laughs> is marketed early in its season as, you know, a pie fruit and a, and a store fruit. Yeah. Uh, but Granny Smith, when it's ripe on the tree, is a beautiful blushed golden yellow. And it's one of the most delicious apples you'll ever eat. As you know by owning one, no, the longer you leave it yeah. on the tree, the sweeter the, it gets. The, the higher the sugar bricks yeah. get, yeah. it gets a little bit of a yellow color, and it just gets better and better all the time. That's fantastic. I mean, that's good to know. And again, it goes back to another interview we did where you know picking the fruit off the vine is second to none. Absolutely. Even going to your Whole Foods, you know, organic grocery section, those apples and any other fruits have been picked days, weeks, and sometimes even months ago, dying since it's been harvested compared to the health and nutritional benefits you get from just going in your backyard orchard and picking a vine ripe fruit. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that I, I always, I got a kick out of, this goes back many, many, many years ago, talking to uh, a couple of commercial apple growers and an apple packer up in the, up, up in the San Joaquin Valley. And, um, they had mentioned uh, red delicious you know and i said you know red red delicious i mean that you know what do, what do you do with red delicious oh red delicious is one of the finest apples in in the world and i say so tell me what you feel the attributes are of red delicious and and the and the two growers said oh that beautiful bright red color i said man eh, i can't argue with that it is beautiful bright red color yeah. and the packer chimed in and said you can cold store it for 18 months and i thought to myself that's the selling point that's, for the commercial that's, grower. that's a commercial attribute. That's yeah. not a backyard attribute. <laughs> I don't want to cold store anything, let alone for 18 months. Yeah. So, you know, I want something that I can go out and pick off the tree when it's ripe and have it taste wonderful. And, yeah. and you know, quite frankly, a, a tree ripe and red delicious is a pretty good piece of fruit. But one that's been in cold storage for 12 months, I'm not so sure. I see it as it's just been dying for 18 months. Absolutely. You know, from the time you harvest it, all that nutritional, the antioxidants that you also do lessons on, all of that is breaking down from the time it's harvested compared to, again, picking that vine ripe fruit. Right, exactly. Talking about fruit, you also do a lot of education on a gardening concept that's relatively new known as the backyard orchard culture. And while people are now learning about apples and wanting to bring these apples to their home gardens, you know, how much space do they need? Like, and I know that ties into the backyard orchard culture concept. Can you please explain that? Well, one of the one of the great things with fruit trees is they don't have to be a tree. You know, you can grow fruit trees as a hedge. You can grow fruit trees a spellyard. You can grow clusters of fruit trees together. Now, where a commercial grower would never ever consider some of the methodology for backyard orchard culture, but then again, a backyard grower should never consider some of the methodology that a commercial grower would use. I, you know, the reason that there's a uh, 12 foot wide roadway here is so that they can run a tractor through here. Yeah. If I was growing <laughs> trees in my backyard, I'm not gonna run a John Deere through my backyard. For sure. I don't need a 12 foot wide roadway. Makes sense. So if I wanted to plant, uh, say if I wanted to plant an Anna apple that ripens up in June, July, and a Gala that ripens up in uh, August and September, and a Fuji that ripens up in, in uh, September and October, and a, a sundowner that ripens up in November, December, I can plant all those trees in the space of one big tree, and I can grow six months worth of successive ripening apples out of the footprint of one tree. So that's what backyard orchard culture is all about, being able to make use of your valuable backyard space to successive ripen and harvest fruit throughout the season. So these four varieties you'd put how close to one another? I have them planted in my backyard at uh, 24 inches apart. 24 inches apart, four trees, and each tree should bear about how many fruit? Uh, I probably get between 75 and 100 fruit off of each tree. So I'm just trying to visualize this, that you're enjoying 75 to 100 fruit for a couple of months, 
and then going to the next flavor for a couple more months, and then the next flavor for a couple more months, yeah, and then the last flavor for a couple more months. Exactly. So you're, uh, in essence, enjoying up to 400 pieces of fruit over the course of about six to eight months. Yeah, that's I mean, it. can't beat that. Out of out of the out of the footprint of one tree, you know, in a in an area that's about uh, 150 square feet. That's amazing. So when it comes to apple care, in my research, I've heard that some of the pollen can be sterile, which is the male parts of the flower, mm -hmm. and that you know some apples are self fruitful, some of them are um, require cross pollination between different varieties. Mm -hmm. As again, planting two of the same is not going to accomplish cross pollination. Cross pollination needs to be between you know, another apple variety. And then you also got to time also the time it blooms. Exactly. Some of them might bloom in a very short period of time and other ones, here we are in, we're at the end of June. And yeah. I'm seeing that there's, I just know 4th of July is right around the corner, but I see there's blossoms on a lot of the apples here in the orchard. Yeah. Still late June. So it's important also time when these plants bloom so that there's pollination happen between these varieties. But tell us a little bit about like, what do apples need when it comes to pollination? Is one apple tree enough? Well, um, there are there are a number of what we would call self-fruitful varieties out there. So Dorset, Golden, uh, Fuji, Gala, uh, Granny Smith, they fall into that category where we would consider them self-fruitful. Okay. So if you planted just one tree, you're still going to get uh, production on that one tree. Okay. Now, from a commercial grower's point of view, they would laugh at that. Commercial grower would never plant an orchard with, say, one solid variety. They're always going to incorporate a small percentage of pollinators in there and what that does is, is it allows you the ability to produce quite a bit more fruit so commercial growers are looking for tonnage yep. they're looking to get the commercial growers are looking to get 300 400 maybe even 500 pounds of fruit off of an individual tree and if wow. you have one single variety <laughs> you're probably not going to get that so by incorporating that pollinator you do get heavier production but there are definitely varieties out there that will do well on their own. Now, I have the luxury in this in this mini orchard here to have 30 varieties. Yep. So my my pollinization is golden. I don't have is. any issues. I have overlapping bloom on all these varieties. And one of the interesting things about this particular growing condition here in Irvine, we get bloom for a very long period of time. So it's now the end of June, but we've been getting bloom out here since early April. Yeah. So I have literally three and a half or four months worth of bloom time out here, yeah. which translates into a, a, a longer ripening period for all these varieties. Oh, you sure. can look on some of these trees and see fruit that's as big as a tennis ball now, next to blooms that are just setting fruit that's the size of a green pea. And they're all gonna ripen up one after the other. And that's how you're gonna get, get to enjoy apples through the entire year. Absolutely. That's wonderful. So we're here in your apple orchard. You planted 30 plus varieties of apples that are all high chill. Of the high chill varieties, which ones are your personal favorites? You know, Charles, I have several favorites out of this this project. Uh, but you know, when we write uh, a report this coming fall, I'm absolutely going to highlight those varieties. But uh, there are probably out of the 30 varieties that are here, I would say there are going to be six or eight varieties that I would really consider standouts that okay. have done very very well. And and um, you know, uh, when the report comes out, we'll go into that in, in great detail. Uh, for now, let's just say that you can do them all, but some are definitely better than others. So you, I, I want to get my fruit evaluation this fall before I really you write know, the report. Put a, put a claim on that. So this report, where are we going to find it? Oh, it'll. I'm sure it'll be on the Dave Wilson website, and you know, it'll be something that um, will be you know made available to the hobbyists and the industry as well so i'm just going to um, pitch that right now at the bottom of the screen i'm going to put the dave wilson nursery website link you can also find it down in the comments down below and there you can actually find how you can buy a lot of these apple varieties from the dave wilson nursery and also find pretty much all the deciduous fruit trees all of the best selling varieties both for home growers as well as commercially can all be found at the dave wilson nursery Dot com website you can find the retailers closest to you you can shop at those local stores and if you don't find it there you can also have them special order those varieties that Dave Wilson will make available from their millions of trees that they produce annually and I think you shared with me this year that you're looking to between this year and next year um, introduce close to 14 million trees into the US and global marketplace so it's that much more life-giving trees. I want to say life-giving, I'm not just talking about the fruit, 
but the fact that we're going to have this many more trees around the planet cleaning our air providing us the life-giving oxygen and it's just such a remarkably amazing like in my research and preparing for today's interview like i always knew dave wilson was amazing but it's just mind-blowing like the the value that you brought to our planet and the education that you share through the dave wilson nursery um youtube channel as well well it's it's an amazing company i i, I feel really honored to be able to represent them and work with them for the past 18 years and and um, you know we produce a lot of trees I feel really good about that I feel really good about what I do for a living you know it, it, it's good for the environment it's good for for agriculture it's good for the homeowner we produce a lot of great trees that have produced a lot of good quality nuts and, and, and fruit over the years and uh, it's it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to work with a company that appreciates this type of, uh, of promotion and uh, has done what I consider to be such such a great thing for not only agriculture but for homeowners over the past 85 years now for Dave Wilson Nursery. Yeah, we're so lucky to have you. And um, I've got another like five other points, but I kind of want to just put them all out in one question. Yeah. Planting tips when it comes to apples, being the focus is on apple care. If you can share in a few sentences talking about location, fertilization, mulch, whitewashing, pruning. Absolutely. Um, if you just want to just generally summarize, like. You know, from the time I bought my apple tree, I know we also talked in other lessons about, you know, they're always in groups, you know, when they're at nursery and then they come home and just all of those things that should be, you know, integrated into um, your fruit tree care lessons. Well, you know, again, look for successive ripening varieties so you can have some early, some mid season, some late. Uh, choose a planting location that's in a full sun exposure. A little bit of late afternoon uh, shade would probably be okay, but okay. you want predominantly sun throughout the day. Uh, look at your soil type. What's one thing we talked about understanding your microclimate. Yeah. How does your soil drain? If you have heavy soil and it doesn't drain well, you want to plant on a rise. You want to be 8 to 12 inches above grade on a little bit of a mound so that you, that, that top root can stay away from that heavy wet soil. Never plant in a depression always come up a little bit on a rise. And that's all of these trees here in the orchard, same All thing. of these are planted. I we, can see we, that they're all elevated. We laid out rows to the north-south and raised them up eight inches and planted on the ridge of that row, ran our irrigation system right down the top of that row, mulched over it. You know, we, we've we've talked about mulch. Mulch does a lot of great things for us. It um, keeps the so summertime soil temperatures cooler, yep. makes better use of our irrigation water by at least 50%. That's huge. Increases the bioactivity in the soil, the mycorrhizal activity, beneficial insects and fungi that help the trees to grow and function in a more natural way. Keeps weed seeds from germinating. So, so you know, you've got, you've got four time. great attributes right yeah. there. And I can't really think of one <laughs> negative when it, when it comes to mulching. So I'm a, I'm a huge advocate of, of mulching. That's great. Fertilization. F fertilizers are all different. You're going to fertilize for a purpose. So the year that I plant the tree and the next couple of years while I'm growing structure, I'm growing the trees to produce a, a fruiting productive scaffold for me. Yeah. So I'm concentrating on a fertilizer that's going to be a little bit higher in nitrogen. I want all the other elements. I want the, uh, the phosphorus and the potassium and I want the zinc and the iron and the manganese. I want all of those things in there, but I want a higher nitrogen so that I can promote growth and structure. Got it. So you're, now, getting, so you're making sure all the macronutrients are there, the micronutrients, absolutely. higher focus on nitrogen. Yes. For, for the first two to three years. Okay. Now, after that first two to three years, I've got the tree up to size. And remember, one of the philosophies of backyard orchard culture is size management. Yeah. So once my trees reach my chosen size, at that point, vigor is not important for me anymore. What's important at that point is root stability and the promotion of fruiting and flowering wood. And that so, stability in the fruit are from what elements? From, from the, the phosphorus and the potassium. Okay. So, and the trace elements absolutely blend themselves to that. Got so it. for the stability, for the promotion of the flowers, for the development of the fruit, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch gears and I'm going to go to a low nitrogen, higher P and K with trace elements okay. that's going to promote that bloom and that, that you know, uh, stable root system yeah. and the ability for the trees to produce a good crop of fruit. That's awesome. I just want to pitch, even though... Um, we're talking just generally about fertilizer, that the Ivory Organic 6 Macros Plus has all the macronutrients. It absolutely and does. You can integrate those macronutrients because they're more balanced. It's an all-purpose. 
you can now in, incorporate what are like higher nitrogen if, if the goal is the first couple of years. You can blend all the macronutrients into something that might be high nitrogen, such as I'm thinking like a fish emulsion would be very high nitrogen, very low phosphorus, potassium, um, and just other things that are gonna drive that nitrogen higher those first few years. Absolutely. Um, and just knowing that those macronutrients are there. If you could touch on whitewashing also. Well, w one of the most important concepts in the Southwest, or even in the nation, let's say, to being successful with fruit trees is to protect them against physical stress. You know, this is, this is Irvine, California. It's in, it's in the heart of Orange County. It's not a really harsh climate. However, uh, we had 117 degrees here last summer, Correct. Uh, right after 4th of July, and uh, it did some damage to some trees. But um, these trees are, came through it with flying colors. There was no structural damage, there was no wood damage, there was no sunburn damage, because we whitewashed these trees from the first time they went in the ground. We've used uh, uh, conventional whitewashes, we've used the, the IV Organics product over the last couple of years. That's fantastic. And. Um, the main reasons are to prevent against uh, physical stress. That sun is going to promote a large amount of physical stress in a short period of time, especially when we get into temperature extremes. Uh, you know, 100 degrees down here is unusual. 117 was unprecedented. Yeah. So we had literally hundreds of thousands of trees in Southern California that were damaged by that heat spike. So you're, you're taking the pressure off the tree. You're allowing the tree to maintain itself and not be affected by the effects of that hot afternoon sun. Yeah. And that's the most important part to protect from. Uh, on the east side of the tree, you're not going to get any sun damage. On the Correct. north side of the tree, it's virtually the no sun damage. Correct. It's all this southwest face. That's where the hottest part of the afternoon sun is, and that's where the damage is going to come. And from. that's the side that needs the most protection. That's the side that needs the most protection. So from the direction we're facing looking at these trees, you can see they're clearly whitewashed on that southwest face. That's great. So whitewashing, predominantly the goal within this orchard is protection during the summer extremes. Protection against the summer extremes, uh, you know, also uh, it's protection against some winter extremes too. Very cold, dry winds. Yeah, I wanted you to say that. Do we have the issues here in Southern California or are we just talking about just nationally across the country? We don't have as bad an issue with winter stress in Southern California as other parts of the country do. Yeah. So I think it would be more important to protect in in uh, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah and Reno, Nevada and you know some of the areas in the Midwest and on the East Coast against wintertime extremes. Okay. But we certainly get the summertime extremes and the same technique and the same products are going to prevent against uh, damage from both. That's fantastic. And that winter extreme is known as um, sun scald. Sun scald. So yes. that's that winter nighttime low freezing, daytime warm temperatures and just guarding and protecting the plant against those fluctuations in temperature during the winter months. Yeah. And, and you know, the most important consideration here is most people don't realize how important whitewashing is until after the damage is done. Can you tell us about like when you buy a plant or like when, like when would you whitewash a plant? Perfect. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you go to a wholesale grower of, of, uh, of trees, so I, you know, I go and look at citrus trees or avocado trees or peach trees at a wholesale nursery, they're running uh, rows and rows and rows of trees. Well, those rows usually run north-south and each one of those rows is shading the row behind it or the trees sure. behind it. So you've got this, um, this self-shading going on at, at the wholesale level. Uh, a lot of retailers have shade structures. They're, they're doing some protection in the retail nursery. So you go to the retail nursery and you buy a five gallon avocado tree and you take it home and you plant it out in an area where there's no shade. It's yeah. out in the middle of your Standing yard. Alone. You wanna give an avocado tree some room. Yeah. So you're not planting it in an area where it's getting shade. And now that tree that's been shaded for its entire life is out in the wide open spaces. So the first thing that's going to happen, and it can happen within a day, is you're going to get sun damage and sun scald on that tree, and that damage is irreparable. You're not going to fix that. Yeah. Once the scar is there, the scar is going to be there for the life of the tree. And the plant and needs to heal over it. Oftentimes it can kill the tree. Yeah. Or it's doing physical stress damage that's going to limit the tree's ability for uptake of nutrients in, in the main trunk. Yeah. So the first thing you want to do when you take a tree home, you dig your hole, you plant your tree, you get it restaked and resituated, and you get it whitewashed. That's gonna that's gonna protect against that that physical stress damage from day one. That's great. Explain summer pruning. When would you do it? Would you do it while there's fruit on the tree, or is this something that follows harvest, or is this something you do monthly? Explain. Okay. So what is summer pruning? First of all, one of, one of the main concepts of, of backyard orchard culture is size control your trees so they're manageable for you. 
I'm, I'm never going to tell anybody how big their tree should be. Um, but for me, a deciduous tree like a peach or a plum or a nectarine or an apricot, the, where the fruit ripens up over a short period of time, two weeks to four weeks, yeah. I'm not climbing 15 feet to pick that fruit anymore. I want that tree right here. I want it size managed so that I can reach that fruit from the ground. I can go out and thin, I can go out and harvest, I can go out and prune and do everything from standing on the ground. I don't want to climb 15 feet to pick fruit anymore. So taking that into consideration, trees are going to grow out through the season. A nice healthy tree can easily grow out six, eight, maybe 10 feet yeah. during the season. And I've already chosen my size. My first two or three years are dedicated to growing the tree to that manageable size. From that point on, anything above my chosen size is never going to be production wood on that tree. My production structure is always going to be like right here. It's going to be right down here where I can reach it. So that growth that comes out in the spring and early summer and goes well beyond the Very managed easy. size for me, yeah. I can come in and in August, I can come in in September, I can come in in the 1st of October, and I can remove all that growth and then allow the tree to put out one more little flush of growth and go dormant naturally. So it's almost a monthly process of pruning. It can be done several times through the summer, it can be done a little bit at a time. Good to know. There are certainly varieties that I don't do uh, much summer pruning on, but in general the varieties that ripen earlier in the season, that have a short uh, uh, hang time on the tree, those are all being maintained at seven to eight feet and anything above that gets cut out. But there's a risk of also burn, right? Like we're going into Absolutely. 117 degree day, let's say, or even 100 whatever. Absolutely. But now that you've thinned it, you've now allowed more light into what was a shady canopy. That's right. So what have you, you seen do, sun damage in, in those yes, situations? Yes, absolutely. So what you want to do at that point is you want to consider whitewash again. Okay. You want to, you want to stand back and look at that tree from the southwest and you want to see where you've opened up uh, exposure to some of those branches. Yeah. Uh, and with some things, it's more important than others. You know, if you've got a big uh, uh, peach tree that's pretty dense headed, you're probably not going to open up much uh, growth to sun damage. But if you have an avocado tree or something that where, where it's very susceptible to sunburn damage and you've exposed some of that fresh green bark, you want to get that whitewash it. right away. It's a race. <laughs> and we look at these trees every year. Yeah. We don't necessarily whitewash them every year, but we've uh, in six years, we've whitewashed them four times. No, I see they're all white, like they, they've all got white bark and I'm gonna be sharing that with the viewers as we you know walk through the orchard. I'll, I'll, right. be, I'll be pointing all of the whitewashing that's been done here. And again, the goal being to alleviate the stress of the summer heat, sunburn, and in the winter offering that sun squalled protection for the trees. Yeah, and, and this is Irvine, California. Yeah. We're not, I'm not really concerned with winter protection here. Uh, but if I was anywhere out of this area, yeah. I would certainly be concerned with that. So that becomes just as important in, if you're in a cold winter climate yeah. as sunburn protection in a southwestern desert climate. Well, I'm looking at pretty much all the trees. Here we are now late June. Most of them have still an open canopy. And I know you do right. summer pruning as well, sometimes on your trees to manage size and, mm -hmm. and, and control shape. Um, but some of these trees still didn't create their canopies you'd otherwise see in the summer as here we are late June and that sun is still like beating within the canopy. And I know that's another added value of whitewashing is to protect the underlying bark from cracking and, and, and getting injured. Absolutely, and, and the, these, these are all late blooming varieties. So they tend to uh, put out their, their canopy thickness a little bit later in the season. Where if I go and look at, uh, if I walk across the field and look at a mid pride peach right now, it's a solid dense shaded canopy yeah. where these are just really starting to put out a little bit of vigor now they won't really have a solid canopy for about another five or six weeks. That's great. Um, in conclusion, and before we do, uh, a few months ago, I got to meet with Kay Cottrell of the Late Bloomer Gardening Show. Mm -hmm. And um, she's also an actress and has been on movies and TV shows. And um, I had her autograph a can of the Ivory Organics on 301 Plant Guard. Would you mind doing the same for me today? Oh, well, absolutely, I'll do that for you. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I feel honored to add an autograph can to your collection. Where I would you want just put it like right around there somewhere. Okay. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you for your time. And I'm honored and a little teaser to everybody else that I'm going to be with you in a, hopefully another few more weeks up in Northern California. Do you want to explain where we're going and what we're going to talk about? Absolutely. We're going to meet up at uh, Dave Wilson Nursery's uh, nursery location in Northern California, and we're going to uh, 
uh, do a similar video on our backyard style orchard project there at the nursery, which incorporates multiple planted trees, multiple budded trees, size control, uh, high density, espaliers, hedgerows. So all the techniques of backyard orchard culture are in that project. We'll look at each and every one and we'll get to eat some spectacular fruit. You made my day. I'm actually going to be losing a lot of sleep between now and then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, Charles. And if you guys hopefully enjoyed this with Tom Spellman here of the Dave Wilson Nursery, be sure to give us a thumbs up. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe, hit that push bell notification, and I'm going to be including the links to the Dave Wilson Nursery YouTube channel where there's over a hundred educational lessons, most of them taught by Tom Spellman as well, where you can learn a lot of these topics that we've you know, just touched upon in great detail. So be sure to check them out and also be sure to subscribe and hit that push bell notification to stay you know, in tune with the latest and greatest um, gardening lessons and tips and tricks to help make this your best growing season ever. As always, keep growing with Ivory Organics and wishing you all happy gardening. Behind our interview are approximately a dozen master gardeners that are tending to the apple trees. And specifically, this last week of June, what they're doing is thinning the apples. And the reason for doing so is to prevent the branches from breaking. Another reason is to improve the size and the quality of each fruit. And the third reason is to prevent alternative bearing years on your fruit tree. So what we're gonna do simply, and what all of the master gardeners did in the lesson is, they simply prepared a solution of bleach and you can do like a 50-50 bleach water solution and they simply took this chlorine, dipped their pruners like so to remove any risk of disease and cross-contamination between the apples and the orchard. And as you can see here, we've got a cluster of four apples and the goal is to thin it down to the best two. That was the lesson that Tom Spellman gave to those master gardeners in the orchard. There goes one, and here's number two. So now all of the resources coming off of this branch are to simply feed and fuel those two. Another lesson Tom gave to the master gardeners in his experimental apple orchard is to remove the bruised and the inferior fruit set. For example, I have a good example over here in this cluster if you take a look over here, you can see that we've got a bruised apple right there that we're gonna remove. And then when it comes to inferior set, you can see that this apple over here is larger than that apple. And so we'll remove the inferior fruit set and we're gonna try to reduce this cluster to a pair of two, as Tom did in his apple orchard. And here we go. And now we've alleviated a lot of that stress on this particular branch.